Hi everyone, Golan Levin here. I'm at the Studio for Creative Inquiry at Carnegie Mellon, and I'd like to thank FITC for inviting me to do this video, Ask Me Anything, and I'd also like to thank all the readers on Reddit who proposed questions for me today. I'm real excited to answer these questions. The video you're seeing today is produced here at the Studio for Creative Inquiry um, by Jonathan Menard from Deep Speed Media and Obvious Jim, James George. Uh, they're going to be doing some tricks that you're going to see. Um, and uh, some new experiments that emerged from the Art and Code conference that we had here that was all focused on artistic implications of 3D depth uh, scanning and d depth sensing. Um, so uh, how do I look from the side? All right, cool. Uh, let's get started. Um, first question. How would you define computer literacy and what are the fundamental computer-related skills that most people should know? Um, okay, so I can't really advise most people because I think one of the most interesting and wonderful things about life nowadays is that there are so many different computer programming environments, computer programming languages, that there really is something for everyone. Like, I can't wait till my four-year-old, you know, is a little older and then he can learn Scratch, you know, for kids, which is great. And there's really specialized programming environments and languages for practically everyone. But I, if you're watching me now, you, you, you're probably, probably a student in the media arts, let's say. Maybe you're an undergrad or a graduate student in a media arts program somewhere. And I definitely have some opinions about that. Uh, I teach media arts here at Carnegie Mellon. And uh, I'm often interviewing people for jobs, maybe teaching media arts. And I do have a few opinions about what, what people should know. And I, I'm particularly concerned with, with computational media arts, where people are, are using the computer to make new kinds of, of software in order to make new kinds of experiences possible. Software is this kind of medium through which we're conducting our lives in new ways. And ever increasingly, it's something that it's a medium that I think people should be able to, to control. And if you're in the arts doing that, then I think you should know a text-based programming language like Java or Open Frameworks which is really processing, let's say, or, uh, you know, or, or open frameworks, which is C++. I think you should know um, a patch-based programming language like Pure Data or Max MSP or VVVV. I think you should know a, a microcontroller programming environment, which these days the de facto standard is the Arduino, which is a wonderful hacker tinkerer kit for making circuits. And I think people should know a web-based programming language, and, and that could mean something like um, PHP or Ruby on Rails. Uh, or if you're an old, old guy like me, you know, Pearl. Um, and uh, then I think there's a couple other accessory skills that are not exactly, you know, like programming, but are real useful today. Video editing, without a question, is really important. Uh, every single person going, going through a university or university-like education, even high school, should really know how to communicate with video. It's tremendously important for communicating nowadays. And, I mean, to a certain extent, people seem to understand this naturally. Their phones can record video. They can upload it to YouTube. It's not a big deal. And yet, it still seems kind of shocking, like when my friend Matt Gray at Northeastern uh, has first-year actor students learn to video edit. Like, well, of course they should be learning video edit. That's how, you know, they have to learn how they're going to be chopped up. Um, a second thing, which has uh, never been easier to learn before until now, is, is uh, 3D modeling. I think 2012 is really going to be the year of, of three-dimensional um, thinking, especially in terms of like printing stuff out with MakerBots and things like that. And with tools like SketchUp and other kinds of online in the browser 3D modelers, it's never been easier. Although, of course, there's always more advanced tools like SolidWorks and so forth if you're up for it. Okay, go on, Levin here again. I have not seen, I have not seen many recent works of figurative computer art. Why does abstract art, uh, computer art dominate over figurative computer art? You know, that's an interesting question. I, I happen to love abstraction. My mom is an abstract expressionist, and I, I, I think that abstraction has the capacity to, to kind of communicate um, in ways that go beyond language and in ways that, that talk to us at a really low, um, low perceptual level. That really gets me excited. So I, I, I think abstraction is beautiful. Um, you're asking about figurative computer art, and you mentioned a couple of my pieces, flocular portraits, segmentation, and system. And I, I think those two pieces you mentioned are actually really abstract. I think they deal with the concept of, of progressive abstraction. And for me, I, I perceive a, a continuum between abstraction and figuration. I, I see a, a place all along there where there's a lot of really interesting places to go that, that, that communicate with us in so many interesting ways. Um, I was just looking today at the work um, by the Universal Everything uh, folks, uh, Matt Pike in particular, with those sort of fluffy characters he's got walking around. And these are hugely abstract to me, at the same time that they're absolutely grounded in a kind of physiological logic that we understand as, as figuration. Um, I also think there's different ways that things can be figurative. Things can be um, abstract visually, but figurative in terms of their kinetics. And I think that's a very exciting place to work. You see that with motion capture. It's a sort of interesting thing. So, I don't know. Uh, a lot of the earliest computer art was abstract because it was just easiest to draw circles and squares. Or actually, that was the only thing that was, you know, 
that you could do. Um, nowadays, I, I think there's a really exciting range, and, and um, I, I definitely see figurative work. No, I, I don't just see abstract work out there. Okay. Um, next question, what's after Connect? And there's a follow-up question to that, which is, uh, when will we see Connect on our phones? Um, and, and I think that's probably a, probably a partial answer to the first question. Um, first of all, I, I think that the answer to that is both, both easy and, and, and difficult. Uh, I, I actually am not a prognosticator. Uh, I do think one should check out the science fiction for, for good answers, because usually that stuff is more correct than not. Um, uh, I do think that um, when I think about like what's after Connect, a lot of people might think like you know what's the next hot new technology, and uh, to a certain extent you can kind of get that from uh, just by looking at the, the the you know looking at the SIGGRAPH papers, looking at the papers from the different technical conferences, and you, there you can see the technologies. It, what happens is is when these things become much cheaper or much smaller or much faster. Uh, uh, Danny Ellis said that when something becomes uh, 10 times smaller or 10 times faster, it becomes a completely different thing. Uh, it's likewise, 10 times cheaper. When I think about like, you know, what's after Connect, I, I don't think that the answer to that should be a technology, but rather a cultural idiom. And, and that's, that's where you say, like, you know, because, because Connect has existed for a while in a variety of forms. You know, I, I saw a, a 3DV uh, depth cam called the Z-cam, you know, uh, probably five, six, seven years ago already. And, and it, there have been depth cameras for a while. It's what happens when these cameras become cheap and distributed throughout the culture that suddenly people have a new way of, of expressing themselves, new things to do with them um, that, that happens there. What, what's after Connect? Certainly it will be very interesting when um, they are in our phones and I, I, I think you can probably see some of that now with the, what's that camera called that can do the, 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 the depth stuff? The, the Which one? The Lytro. the Lytro camera, that's exciting. Definitely if you're interested in cameras, I mean, check out also everything that's going on uh, at the Media Laboratory and the, and the Camera Culture Group there. It's really crazy stuff, uh, adva really advanced and very interesting things happening there. Um, and when cameras become sort of ubiquitous and super small and super cheap, then you'll start to see some of the sort of augmented reality things that you're going to, you know, you've been seeing mock-ups of or, or interesting artistic experiments of. Um, the stuff I'm looking forward to is greater kinds of, of understanding of images and sound, frankly. I, I think we're almost there with speech understanding. I think that we are um, getting closer and closer with image understanding, and there's such great frontiers there. Um, you know, the fact that Jason Saragi just made the, the face tracker that is in, starting to show up in so many interesting places. These kinds of, of, of leaps uh, towards better understanding what people are doing in spaces uh, will make massive differences for how we can create new kinds of interactions and new kinds of artwork and, um, you know, new improvements to, to life through design. Okay. Do you think an open source approach to government is possible, desirable, likely? Um, that's really interesting. Okay, I gotta say right off here, I, I'm not an expert in this. Okay, uh, I, I here I, I really look um, as you know, you know, to folks like um, Jennifer Palka from from Code for America uh, and Julian Assange from WikiLeaks as uh, sort of uh, two <laughs> opposite ends of the spectrum for how we can sort of open up governments. Um, to make them more transparent. Um, I do think that um, open source government is possible. It is desirable. I think it's inevitable in some respects. Uh, and I think that one point about it is that I don't necessarily know if it's going to come from the governments themselves, which is why you see efforts like WikiLeaks or Code for America, um, which have very different objectives, but sort of are both grassroots operations in some respects, um, having the approaches that they do. Um, I think that it's always going to come from outside of governments. And I also think there will always be parts of governments that are necessarily opaque. Um, and that's it's possibly for the better if it's things like nuclear secrets or what have you. But um, for the most part, I, I really do hope, and I, I have a lot of admiration for, for both WikiLeaks and for Code for America in terms of their objectives of, of opening up governments and, and helping greater transparency happen. So this is a large multi-part question, which you can, you can see on the Reddit. Um, I'm going to kind of paraphrase it. The, the guy says, uh, or person says, uh, do you think the value of a high-priced, top-tier institution art degree has value? Um, and I think broadly the multi-part question that was asked by a couple other people is, is just, in fact, generally what's the value of, of a degree at all? And there's a lot of reasons why you know, 
one can question this. One can say, you know, uh, and, and the person or people do, they, they say, you know, like, for example, like if you're learning about technology, like maybe the technologies you've learned are obsolete by the time you graduate, or, or maybe the old boy network or so forth that you would ordinarily use to justify, um, you know, a, a degree is maybe less valuable when the people who are doing the stuff you care about are connected over the network, the, the computer network, and, and not necessarily, you know, in, in the same space as you. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this, actually, and, and kind of wondering myself, uh, you know, critiquing the institution from the inside, what is the value of a degree and how can a degree be, be valuable? Um, and it, I, I mean, I've been certainly looking at a number of, of resources that I, I sort of have put great questions in my own mind. You look at institutions like um, the Machine Project or the Public School in Los Angeles. Uh, which are doing fantastic work, you know, completely extra institutionally to allow people to learn things they want to learn. Or you can look at um, the phenomenon of badges and how they are, uh, you know, like by Adafruit and these other kinds of things where it's like, I learned connect hacking, you know, or something like that, where it's, it's uh, you know, that's the skill that you care about and that's the skill that you feel proud to, to announce to the world that you have. Um, uh, but also there's some fantastic books now on the topic. Like Keo Stark has just, just got a... Uh, Kickstarter secured where she's going to be working on a book which is all about alternatives to going back to school, like why you sh shouldn't or don't have to go back to school. It's awesome. And and probably the book that kind of ruined my my entire last year um, was Why Art Cannot Be Taught by James Elkins, which just lays it out, like why art cannot be taught. And I, that just kind of ruined me. I came into class thinking like, oh, man, what's the point? You know, like you either got it or you ain't. But, but, um, I'm, I'm an optimist again. I think that there's really something important to be had from being able to smell people. I think that there's, there's really no substitute for being able to make friends and work with them in the same space. And even when I, you know, have collaborators and colleagues and peers who are distributed all over the world, you know, as I do right now, for example, uh, you know, with the Open Frameworks community or the, the Connect Hacking community or whatever it might be, you know, all the really amazing energy gets brought to a focus when you bring them to the same place, um, you know, for a hackathon or something like that. And, and uh, it happens, you know, right now when I, for example, I've, I've brought James George here to, to collaborate uh, with me and Jonathan Menard on, on the video you're seeing now. Like, when you bring people together to the same space, that's when the magic happens. And um, so I guess the value of, of a degree, I can't speak for the value of the piece of paper. What I can speak for the value of is, is really being in the same place with other people and working with them and learning together. Um, next question. Uh, here we go. Let me move this up over here. Okay. So next question. Uh, I have a data set, this person writes, that is more than 400,000 responses from people where they rated something from 0 to 100. The people are divided into about three dozen categories. How would you visualize a data set like this? Okay, sir. I uh, want to say, uh, first of all, uh, I'm available for consulting. Um, but uh, if you'd like to try it on your own, my top recommendation would be to dump that stuff into many eyes, which is a, a really quick way of trying out lots of different visualizations over at IBM, which was made a couple years ago by Martin Wattenberg and Fernando Villegas. That's, that's how I would uh, try it out. Because you just throw it in there, you'll be able to try out so many different things, you'll, you'll really, I think, have good luck. Maybe a stack graph will work for you, for example. And um, if that doesn't have the kind of flexibility you need, uh, start tinkering around processing. Ben Fry in his uh, Visualizing Data book gives a whole bunch of tools and suggestions for how you can get started doing, checking that stuff out. Okay. What does that do? Is that messed up? Reel it in. Bring it back in. Yeah? All right, let's do another question. When computers surpass human intelligence, should we be scared or happy? This is, you know, as Minsky said, you know, how do you define intelligence? Uh, computers have surpassed human intelligence if you just look at, you know, if you say, like, how fast can they add numbers, right? Uh, I don't think that they're ever going to um, surpass intelligence the way, the way we understand other humans, but uh, at, at, uh, other human intelligences. But I think they'll certainly fool us well enough that we can get, you know, interesting work done, you know, ask Siri questions and things like that. Um, yeah, I, uh, I don't think that the singularity is going to happen, but I, I could be wrong. You know, Kurzweil could be right. I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. But uh, 
the second question, though, here, what about a singularity without computer intelligence, like that proposed by Cory Doctorow? Well, there, I, I agree. I actually think we're, we're there already, or we're close to it. Kevin Kelly has a great video called uh, The Next 5,000 Days of the Web, where he talks about that. And there, you can definitely see the cumulative effects of, you know, an internet, which is, or a network, rather, of, of, of millions of neurons. And he, it, Kevin Kelly's um, observations of the complexity of the entire sphere of connected um, um, computers is approximately right now on the order of the single, the same size as a single human brain. And it is going to become very interesting when that becomes 100 million times more complicated. And that will be like the greatest network ever built and, and certainly will be able to do some very interesting things. Um, I, I think of it about, I think of it as kind of the world becoming one mind. I think it's beginning more like that than sort of the computers taking over and, you know, Skynet. Um, but maybe I'm an optimist of sorts. Let's see if we're still, you know, above water. Okay. The, you know, the, the thing that I didn't say is like, you know, like once you can have all of the human minds connected, what are they going to think about? Porn. You know, I mean, it's, 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 it's not like we're going to have some, some kind of golden age of, of like massive intelligence. Um, should we do another one? Yeah, we're going. We're rolling. All right. We're still rolling. That you, you, you got a whole bit you got? No. Oh. Just the tail end. All right. Where can I meet hot single robots who aren't just creepy people pretending to be robots on the internet? This, at first, this, I was immediately thinking of the work of Hiroshi um, Ishiguro. Uh, instead of making uh, creepy people pretending to be robots, he makes creepy robots pretending to be people. Um, but I actually think if you check out the work of Heather Knight, uh, Marilyn Monroe, you'll see that uh, she's got a, a cute little robot fella. Uh, I bet he's single. I think his name is Data. Check out her, check out her work with him. Um, she might be able to hook you up. <laughs>